know about you, but I could use a of <coughs> gathering, of centering, of resting in the Lord as these two young men light the candles that are the symbol of Christ's love and light that burns ever and always in our lives. Let us rest in the Lord. You'll find a call to worship at the front page of your program. Read the bowl. <clears throat> Praise to God, our Creator, source of our being and wellspring of life. Praise God, our Creator, who sets us free and gives us hope. Praise to God, the Word, love made flesh to dwell among us. Praise to Jesus Christ. Praise to God the Spirit, fiery light and rushing wind. Praise the Holy Spirit, who inspires, challenges, conquers, and sustains us. Come, let us worship the earth maker, pain bearer, the life giver. Let us worship God. Let us stand as we are able and sing our opening hymn number 439.
let us prepare now for a time of confession. Silencing our hearts, our worries, our cares and concerns. Let us pray together. God of all mercy, the secrets of all hearts are known to you alone. You know who is just, and you forgive the unjust. You alone are the almighty judge. We are not worthy of judging anyone, and it is of no use that we judge ourselves, knowing your deep forgiveness. Help us rest today in this forgiveness. <coughs> The assurance of pardon that I'll read today is taken from Micah chapter 7, verses 18 to 19. Micah says to God, Who is a God like you, who pardons sins and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our inequities into the depths of the sea. Amen.
Would the children please come forward? last month and today's the day they get to leave the barn and their moms and go out into the grass and she said she needs some help because when they get into the road sometimes they want to run one way or another down the road and so you're going to stand and make a wall and make sure they go across <laughs> freeing the lambs <laughs> so and you have boots on why do you think Probably ticks, that's right. Or wet. I don't know what you're going to do. What are you going to do? Just get get wet feet, maybe, huh? <laughs> but that way we can see your pink toes anyway, so that's good. All right, so I wanted to tell you another story, which is probably one of my favorite. It's a very, really Guilford Bible story. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's a Bible story, and it has something to do with singing and the Holy Spirit. And it's about two men, Paul and Silas, who were disciples of Jesus. Jesus had died, as you know, and then he had gone to heaven. Um, but Paul and Silas were still talking to people about God and were what were called Christians, like we're Christians. But in those times, they got in trouble for being Christians sometimes. So they were put in jail. So Paul and Silas were put in jail. And I like to think of them as being sort of like Peter, where's Peter? He's gone, he thought of the baby. Peter and Fred. So what do you think Peter and Fred would do if they were sitting in jail, somebody put them in there because they were talking about Jesus? What do you think they would do with their free time? Knowing them. Sing. 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 Of course. So they just sat there in jail and were singing. And singing. And you know what happens when really good singers sing? Other people join. So you could hear other people joining. And so many people started singing. They say that there was, that the earth rose up, the Holy Spirit created an earthquake. And what do you think happened if there was an earthquake? What? The two fell got destroyed. That's right. The walls fell down. So now this is a really interesting point. The walls fell down, but there was another person in the story, and he was the jailer. So let's say Tony is the jailer. <laughs> he was keeping them in jail. What do you think he thought when the walls fell down and his two prisoners, though there were no walls to keep him in? What do you think? Look for a new job. <laughs> he says, better look for a new job. That's exactly right. He was afraid he would lose his job. That's exactly right, because the walls were no longer there. But you know what Paul and Silas did? They stayed, because they cared so much about the jailer, they didn't want him to get in trouble. And so you know what they did? The jailer took the prisoners home, and they had dinner at his house. <laughs> How about that? So I think that's a great story, don't you? So basically, God freed the prisoners, and the prisoners freed the jailer, and they all had a nice time together. <laughs> Which is a pretty great story, don't you think? Yeah. So you're going to pretty much... 
but what about the other people in jail who are actually bad? <laughs> That's a scary question. How about I dig into the Bible and see if they talk about it? I don't know. Does anybody know what happened to the other people? Maybe they were. Maybe they fell in love with Jesus too, and everything. Yeah. So they were singing. Maybe they were transformed by the Holy Spirit. That's a very smart question. But you have to know if you lived through that experience of having God free you and in, with singing that you probably would never be the same again. So now today you're going to go and free the lambs. And you get to be free of Sunday school, so everybody will be in freedom. <laughs> All right. So let's pray. <coughs> Dear God, we know you use your Holy Spirit in amazing ways to free us from our sadness, to free us from our worries, to free us in times that we think there is no way out. Help us understand this Holy Spirit and Pray and sing whenever we can so that others too can learn your freedom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we're going to sing a shepherd's song while they go down and get ready to go to the lambs. My shepherd will supply my need.
Uh, my daughter asked, uh, apologizes for the honking horn from the car. She was picking up her dog. Um, today's lesson is written in the 25th chapter of Matthew, verses 35 to 40. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. Was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. <coughs> then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. May God add a blessing to the reading. Um, 
I am the director currently of the Brattleboro Community Justice Center. We're one of 20 volunteer um, and staff justice centers around the state of Vermont. And in fact, the one we have in Brattleboro was one of the first. Um, I've been a volunteer there for probably 10 years at least at this point, um, before I became director. Um, and I remember reparative panels we were running, and there were actually three different reparative panels out of Guilford at the time. Uh, so people were fairly active here uh, in uh, running our reparative panels. Uh, I'm going to talk about what we do briefly and uh, why the kind of work that we do matters, at least um, why I think it matters. Uh, I looked up some statistics. I don't know if anyone saw the interview with Brian Stevenson on uh, the News Hour last week. He's a criminal justice advocate in Alabama. Um, uh, and uh, he had some interesting figures. I went back and listened to it again. In the 1970s, there were only 300,000 people in prison in the United States. Now we are, according to Brian, 2.3 million. So uh, within a period of 45 years or so, we've grown that much. In 1980, our prison system in the United States, the entire country, only cost us $6 billion. $6 billion. Last year, it cost us $80 billion. That's in a period of 35 years that's happened. This was thing I found interesting. The News Hour had this up. By the age of 23, 49% of black men, 44% of Hispanic men, and 38% of white men have been arrested by the age of 23. Uh, so what do we have in Vermont here? Right now our prison population is about 1,900 prisoners. Some are still out of state. Uh, we've reduced it by 350 prisoners in the last couple of years because there's a push to get people out of jail. So um, among New England states, we actually uh, don't have the best rate of incarceration. We are led with lower rates by uh, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Maine. Um, so they all have lower rates of incarceration than we do here. If anyone's interested, Texas has the most people incarcerated, followed closely by California. When you look at the figures for Texas, it's about one-third of the entire population of the state of Vermont. So what do we do at the Justice Center? There's two main programs we have. We have reparative panels, which are uh, groups of citizens from uh, uh, our local area. Mary, I know you served on some reparative panel for years. I sat on some panels with you, actually, at one time. Um, and um, we run seven of these. There's five at night and two during the day. And people are referred to us either through the court system from the police department in Brattleboro or through the state's attorney's office for Wyndham County or into various other ways people come to us. They uh, meet with a group of people um, who are from our community. And uh, uh, they usually meet once a month for four months and there's three main questions that get asked. Who was harmed or affected by your conduct? Uh, how were they affected or harmed? And this is an ongoing conversation. Uh, a non-punitive conversation, a voluntary conversation, a conversation the person who comes into that circle is allowed to participate in and be a full participant. We're just figuring things out. Third question is, is well, how do we fix this? How do you repair the harm? How do you make it good? Um, and um, it works. For the most part, these work. Sometimes there's often a fourth question, which toward the end of the meetings comes up, which is, uh, uh, well, how do you keep yourself from getting this kind of fix again? It's a non-punitive process. It's a process that attempts to repair what amounts to a terror in our social fabric, in the fabric of our community. We're just trying to sew this up, fix it, make it good. How do we do this? And this doesn't necessarily mean avoiding responsibility. It 
means accepting it, and looking at it, seeing what it is, and making it good. It's not a sentence. It's not punishment. The other uh, main program we run is our call our circles of support and accountability. And uh, these help uh, people released from uh, prison reintegrate back into their community. There's a reason I gave you those figures at the beginning of uh, uh, what I was uh, uh, saying here today. Most of those people, almost all of those people who are numbers will be coming out of prison back into our community. They will be here. Maybe 5% of people that are sentenced in the country will have to stay in prison the rest of their lives. The rest of them are coming back to us. So how do we make them part of our community again? How do we reintegrate them into what we do? Um, this is a little more work intensive than our reparative programs. We meet with a person once a week, at least the minimum of once a week for an hour, and we just go through what is going on with them in their lives. We will help them get work. We will help them get whatever identifications they need. We will have, if they're entitled to government benefits, we'll help them with that. If they need medical care, we'll make sure they get set up with some medical care provider. We'll just help them. Um, uh, as they, these, these usually last a year, and some go longer. I've been on coaches that have lasted up to four years, actually. Um, and, this also is our staff and volunteers from the community who do this. Some relationships get fairly well developed and they continue beyond the one week meeting. Uh, and uh, people are just helped. Um, and getting, uh, get them to resettle. It's really difficult to imagine what goes through the mind of a person that's been in prison for seven years or 18 years or however long it's been just walking out of there and not being in that structured environment and have to suddenly take care of themselves is difficult. We took, a, we took a fellow over to the grocery store, been in jail 18 years, and planted him in the cereal aisle. We came back, he was standing in the same place an hour later. He just didn't know what to do. <laughs> uh, so. It's not, it's not easy. So we help with that. And the program itself gets funded through the Department of Corrections. That's money that helps, uh, help us, helps us do the work. And really, their motto for the program is no more victims. And what we actually do is uh, uh, recidivism risk reduction through that. And the way we do it is we help people. We help them. So, why does this matter? Um, as um, I think Lisa might have mentioned, I come to you as a Quaker, so um, um, one of our traditions is uh, we uh, tend to advance our conversations by what we call queries, which are questions, we just instead of pronouncing things, we just ask. It. Is something happening? Am I doing this? And so the question is, how should we treat people who have caused the tear on our social fabric? How do you want to treat them? I mean, there's the common idea of how they should be treated, but really, how do you want to treat them? So the, that's for the reparative program. And the circles of support and accountability, as I said, almost all the people that are in jail sometime they're, are going to get out. And so when they return to society, how should we be treating them? Uh, I remember years ago, probably 20 years ago, I was driving down a street in Maryland, and uh, there was a van in front of me, and there was a bumper sticker on it that said, I have an angel on my shoulder. And my immediate reaction was, well, who's angel of mine? You flip it around. As today's um, message has said, as you do for the least of these, uh, you have also done for me. And the way I see this basically is it's a way to work with grace, with the idea of grace. So, 
The quality of mercy is not strain. It droppeth from heaven as a gentle rain on the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him that takes. And therefore, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We ought to pray for mercy, and that same prayer teaches us to render the deeds of mercy. So, I always thought that should be in the Bible, too. <laughs> Amen. So, anyway, thank you, folks. Thank you. song that says the same thing in another way by Johnny Cash. Peter, did you want me to, but I'm going to apologize for looking down a lot. I'm going to be making the high count. There's a heck of a lot of words in this song. <laughs> I've been studying it for one day. We'll do this again someday, and then I'm going to have to be looking down. They're all good words. They're all good words. <laughs> Thank you. 
let us pray. <laughs> Lord, you offer freedom to all people. Break the bonds of fear and isolation that exist. Hear our prayers for those in prison. Give them repentance and conviction for change. Let them believe in you. Give them patience and hope in their sufferings and bring them home again soon. Support with your love their families, friends, and those they love. Let them trust in you and live with hope. Give wisdom and compassion to those who work within the prisons and justice system to create a system which embodies righteousness and mercy. Comfort and heal those who have been wounded by the actions of others, especially the victims of crime. Bless the volunteers, circle of support and accountability volunteers, reparative panel members, DARA, and the staff and volunteers of Barrel Pearl Community Justice Center. Give wisdom to our legislators as they ponder how to best reform our criminal justice system to lead toward true healing and reconciliation. Give compassion to our communities that we might work together to relieve the bonds which have been broken. Help us all to forgive one another, to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly together with Christ in his strength and in his spirit, now and every day. Amen. Amen. Join together now in the prayer that Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from responsible for pondering how best to spend our mission. And oh, and Judith. Judith. Everybody knows Judith. So uh, this year we made the decision to make an offering to the Brattleboro Community Justice Center and we wanted to have you understand why that decision was made. And I want to thank um, what, uh, Connie and Joy in particular for their work today preparing this service and Dara for coming. Dara suggested that we sing Amazing Grace as our closing hymn. Um, many of you don't, I mean, many of you know this, but it was written by a man who had been a, a slave owner and who was turned around in the middle of the ocean and wrote this song, that song. So just when we get to that, that you could carry that in terms of repentance and reconciliation. So now is the time to make our offering. I know so many of you make so many kinds of offering to the work of this church and to the greater good of our community. This is the time I would ask that you offer what you can in terms of your treasure uh, to do the work of this church. <clears throat>
stand if you're able.